Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 17. We're going to begin as we've been continuing through. This is our third teaching throughout through this particular chapter, and we're picking up in verse 16 this morning. I've titled this message, although it's the same as the previous two, The Lord's Prayer. It's part three, though. That's the only difference of it. I felt that this particular portion of Scripture needed to be broken up in three different areas. That's what the Lord showed me. But just to give you a little bit of catch up, if this is your first time, or you've never gone through the book of of the Gospel of John, or you don't know what the chapter 17 is all about, well, Jesus is now going to the cross. He is hours from going to Gethsemane and being arrested, and then going through the time and the trial before he is scourged and then lifted up on that tree on Calvary, on Golgotha. And he comes now to the Lord, his father, in prayer. And, and he seeks him as a dad. He seeks him as a father. He addresses him such. So Jesus now, in the first six verses, has prayed. And he's prayed for himself that he, by his life and by what he's going to do, will glorify the father. Really simple. Lord, what I do may glorify you. Let me ask you a quick question. Is what you do in your life, do you ask that question? Lord, let me glorify you. Lord, let me be a testimony to you. Do you ask that of the Father? Whatever you're engaged in, whatever you're involved with, do you ask that? Secondly, then, Jesus is praying now for his disciples to be preserved and that they have a joy that would remain in him. Know this, that Jesus personifies joy. It's not the thing, joy, but it is Jesus. Jesus is joy. Jesus is peace. Jesus is love. Jesus is strength, you see. And that's why folks without Christ, without Jesus, have issues and problems and situations and don't know what's going on in their life or don't know what's going on with their loved ones or people they care about. They don't have an idea because they're not either, number one, saved or, or in that sense, um, they're just uh, not understanding. And you can't. The Bible says if you don't have the Spirit of God, then you cannot be spiritually discerned means you don't know what's going on in the life of that Christian or why they're doing things for the Lord. But, but Jesus had prayed for preservation to the Father, to preserve his disciples, speaking of his 12, and that they would have joy. Why would they have joy? Because they're going to be coming to a lot of trials. That he said even in 14, John 14, 1, he said, you know, let not your heart be troubled. Because he knew He knew that they would be encountering much trial once he left. But Jesus said, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm I'm giving you the helper. I'm giving you the spirit, my Holy Spirit, one of the three of us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that will guide you into all truth and that is a reprover of righteousness. And he, in fact, will be there for you to call upon since I won't be here. But now Jesus will be finishing his prayer to the Father as he intercedes for his disciples to do a couple things. One is is that they would be sanctified from this world by the truth of his word. I think that is so important. That word sanctified simply means for you and I to be set apart. Set apart. So Jesus prays to the Father and says, Lord, God, I pray that you sanctify them. You set them apart from the world. And you and I as Christians are called to be set apart from the world, to be different from the world, to be used. If we are not set apart for the Lord, then we're not going to be used for the Lord. And we're not going to understand what the Lord is trying to show us. But it's interesting because he says, by the truth of his word, and I'll get into that. We've also been taught in this prayer, I believe, the posture of prayer. Not like, oh, the posture of prayer, okay, not like that. But our heart's posture, guys. What is the posture of your heart? When you enter into prayer, are you so distracted with what's going on in your life or the situations or the kids that need lunch in an hour or, your, or, or the appointment you've got to be at or whatever? Are you so preoccupied with that that your posture of prayer is then your heart is, is divided, your heart is harried up? 
and, 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 and you can't fully focus on the things of God, I think you can all agree with me that in this chapter, knowing what happens in chapter 18, Jesus had a lot going on, did he not? Can I get a little amen? Yeah, he, he, he was going to be crucified, was he not? He had a lot going on in his life. Yet he still chose to separate himself and pray to the Father. He still chose to pray that God would be glorified, the Father would be glorified by what he did. And then he prayed for his disciples specifically and then for those who would come to know him in the future. So we've been taught this posture of prayer which truly is an attitude of heart and a focus of our mind upon him. We've also been taught that prayer is, the, is only for those who are his. This prayer that Jesus prays are only for those that are his, that belong to him and will belong to him. Not for someone who is not a child of God, in other words, but for his disciples, for his children, for his family in the present and in the future for all eternity. His followers, in other words, and telling his followers that they too will be hated because they follow Jesus. They'll be hated by the world because they follow the name of Jesus Christ. And now we'll see the importance of the word in our lives and its power. We'll also see his prayer for the children and for those who will be his children in the future. And then we're also going to see at the end in verse 25 and 26, we're going to see the confidence Jesus has. I love his confidence. He has such confidence in his prayer knowing that he's declared all that the Father has commissioned him to, to declare. Everything the Father has asked of him, he has done. Then he speaks about the motivation at the very end, and that's love. That's love. The motivation of salvation itself is because of love. The love that God has for his creation. The separation that was caused by the fall in the Garden of Eden. And that God desired such a way because of his love that he desired such a way that they be joined together but there was only one way and one way possible by a true sinless offering. An unblemished lamb. Fully a picture of the Old Testament sacrifices. Not without spot, not without blemish. Meaning Jesus was sinless. All pictures and all types of Christ and what he's gone through. So in chapter 17, let's begin this morning in verse 17 of the Gospel of John. Verse 17 begins like this. Sanctify them, Jesus prays, by your word, by your truth, your word of truth. So he says, sanctify them, set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. Again, I say that the word sanctify means to be set apart. To be kind of put from here to here and just know this, that as God has set you apart, you have been justified. If you gave your life to the Lord this morning before communion, you have been justified. Justified by the blood of Christ. Justified by his sacrifice meaning you're saved. Now begins a walk of sanctification. You are being sanctified. God has now plucked you from here and put you over here, and now it's that work in progress. You know, the Bible doesn't teach sinless perfection, and neither do we, because it's a process that we go through, and it's called sanctification. It's a setting apart. Many times as we have been set apart from the world by the fact that we are saved, now begins a sanctifying walk in your life. That you're not perfect, and that's okay. And God says, that's okay. I want you to be all imperfect when you come to me because then I get the glory of redeeming you and I get the glory of, of, of not only cleaning you up on the inside, but cleaning you up on the outside just like a good fisherman does. 
And so in the sanctifying walk, which doesn't end until we go to see the Lord, then becomes our glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. And glorification, oh my goodness, you guys know what that's about to an understanding that we can understand it, right? We go to heaven. Every question we've ever asked is answered. We know, and a lot of people will go, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Paul this, or I'm going to ask the Lord this. And it's like, seriously, really? Because when we get to heaven, it says we're going to be like Christ. We are joint heirs of the inheritance that's been given. And because of that, we're going to show up and go, I understand. <laughs> I get it now. You see? And so, so in that, that's the glorification. But we are constantly being sanctified. Yes, it's a theological term in and of its sense, but the process within a believer's life is one that is in a being process. It's not like a snapshot. In fact, that's the, the, the really, when you, when you speak of sanctification and you look at the original language, it's in the tense and the, 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 the grammar of such that is in the being. It doesn't end. It's like a, a moving motion picture in a sense versus a snapshot of a photograph. It's ongoing, which means, guess what? Uh, you fumble and mumble today, but tomorrow, by his grace, his mercies are new every day, you're, you're, you're forgiven if you repent and you can continue on in your walk. That's sanctification. I'm so glad that God is moving us closer and closer and closer into his likeness, aren't you? Think about when you first got saved, what you were like. I think about it. I was like such a dummy. <laughs> and I don't mean that in the sense of like, well, I didn't know that there was not 66 books to a Bible, or I didn't know about the Apostle Paul or any of those things. Uh, uh, I just didn't understand what this relationship was all about. I didn't understand that I had to let go of myself and what I knew to be what I thought. And I had to let God do the work in my life and sanctify me, set me apart for his good pleasure and for his work. And so really, when we, when the, when we talk about holiness as well in the Bible, it also means the same thing. To be holy is to be set apart. It's not like you're walking around with a halo and people see it. It's not walking around with the biggest Bible uh, uh, under your arm or the largest cross across your chest, or a cool Christian t-shirt, that does not make you or I holy. No more than it makes us saved. But to be holy means to be set apart, given over to the things of God, and living a life for Jesus Christ. Not in perfection, but in honesty and sincerity of heart that you are following Jesus to the best that you can. Like Pastor Chuck would always say, do your best and commit the rest. Just do your best in the Lord to honor him and commit the rest to him. You see, and to be sanctified, set apart, or to be holy in that sense, it's truly a way of life for followers of Jesus Christ. It's not a momentary thing, like I've said. It's a way of life. It does not end for the believer until you go home to be with Jesus. It continues on. Also being set apart, you're being set apart from the corruption, the death of this world, and now you can be used by God. Know this, that whenever the Bible talks about corruption, that Jesus saw no corruption means he did not decay in the physical sense. He did not also see death in the spiritual sense because he was resurrected by the power of God. And you and I, too, will not see corruption as children of God. Isn't that great? <laughs> I am going to, this tent will die. This physical thing you see will die. But it will not. I will not. My soul will not. My spirit will not see corruption because I will live in eternity with Jesus. And so will you if you have a relationship, if you are born again. And you can be used by God. It means also to be used for God's special pleasure 
and his purpose. To be vessels of honor, as it tells us, to be worthy in his house. And as God sanctifies us, he's setting us apart more and more. The things that we were doing when we first came to the Lord, we're not doing those things so much anymore. But we're doing different things. That it's not that I cannot do those things, but I don't have to do those things because I'm saved, because there's something better. See, I don't have to anymore. Jesus prays to the Father that his disciples be set apart. And by this prayer, now I want to tell you what sanctification is not. Sanctification is not something you can do on your own. Jesus didn't leave this to the disciples to do all by themselves. He prayed to the Father for their sanctification, for their setting apart, for their preservation to the Father. And this is a work that only God can do, not you and not me. And that is a work of God that is being done day by day and minute by minute, hour by hour, year by year in our lives, in us and through us. That's what, so, so you and I cannot sanctify ourselves on our own. Also, something that sanctification is not is something that is done on the outside. Not something that, that by changing our appearance externally makes us now a follower of Christ. But it's something, a work that begins on the inside or in the heart of a person and not on the outside. A lot of people look the part of a Christian. But it's not real unless it's in the heart. It's not real unless it's in the heart. The third thing of what sanctification is not is that it happens overnight. You and I live in a very fast world, do we not? Cell phones, iPhones, droids, and all this jazz, computers, microwaves. Well, you just, that's kind of outdated, right, in microwaves. It's like, you know, I can get on my phone faster things than I can get on my, my home computer. It's amazing. And I can go anywhere in the world, and I can get whatever information I want at my fingertips. How many of you now, it just as a little inquiry here, just for my own benefit, how many of you, if you can remember this as I do, when we grew up without cell phones and even uh, auto dial, how many of you had a pretty good memory bank of telephone numbers in your head? <laughs> yeah, well, okay, well, I kind of see here and some of the, about a quarter of you know, so I can know your age. <laughs> there used to be a time to where I had every area code that I would call and every phone number in my mind. That was my Siri, Right? For those of you who have iPhones, that was my, like, Siri. That was my Google information. It was right there. But nowadays, what? Uh, what do you think they're doing in Afghanistan? I don't know. Let's Google it. Information. Uh, what do you think the, the word means about sanctification? I don't know. Siri, what does sanctification mean? Well, we're, we're told what it is right then and there. Instantaneous. Amazing, huh? Well, something that sanctification is not, I guess God is still into the old-fashioned way of doing things. Old school, we might call it. And sanctification is not something that happens overnight. The idea and the way of sanctification means that it's a process. It's a process, guys. It doesn't happen immediately. It's not a walk. I'm sorry, it's not a, 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 a running, but it's a walk. It's a, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. That's what sanctification is all about. Notice that when Jesus prays that he will set them apart in, in this verse, in verse 17, it says that he will set them apart via the word. He says the word is truth. Because he says prior to that, that they would be sanctify them by your truth. Then he says, your word is truth. So he brings something different into the mix here this morning, guys. He says that the truth is also the word, and the word is also the truth. And that is the one thing that sanctifies, sets us apart from the world. 
How does the word sanctify us? How does the word uh, set us apart? And why is it called truth? Well, the first thing is, I believe the word of God refines us. And the word of God defines us into the character and likeness of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2.11 says this, For both he who sanctifies and those who are, here's that word again, being sanctified are all of one. You see? Going back to what sanctification is not, it's not an overnight thing. It's not an immediate thing. We are being sanctified. So it refines us and defines us in who we are and what we're about as followers of Christ. The second thing is the word is good for us. The word is so good for us. Jeremiah 15, 16. I love this. You ever tried it? Uh, your words were found and I ate them. Not physically, of course. Don't eat your Bibles. But, but truly, the word is found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Man, the word of God is good for you. It's good manna. It's good food. It's tasty to ingest. I don't know about you guys. Sometimes I'll ingest the word of God spiritually and I'll have to regurgitate it a little bit too. You ever done that? It's just kind of the regurgitation of your mind. You ever read Book of Romans? You know, it's like, wow. Paul, how are you describing that? It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. I have to read it again. I've ingested it. I'm having joy in it, but I've got to bring it back up again so that I can, I can mull it back over my mind. So the Word of God is really good for us. Third thing is the Word grows us. The Word grows us, so it refines us and defines us. It's good for us, and now the Word will grow you. Now we're speaking spiritually here. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It grows us. Also, 2 Timothy 3.16 all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? Verse 17. So that the man of God or woman of God, man in the Greek is human, not a, a sexual type, orientation type, but human, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So is the scripture, is the word of God good for you? You bet it is. Ingest it. Take it in. Saunter up to the buffet of the Bible and say, Lord, feed me. Do you approach the word of God that way when your devotional time of study? Do you devote your time to the Lord? Are you doing devotions every day with the Lord? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Taking time away from your day or before your day begins to get your marching orders from God. Are you, are you doing that and saying, Lord, as I approach your word this morning or whenever you do, Lord, speak to my heart. Clear those things out so I can hear from you clearly. You know, and so, so receiving the word. I, I've gone many times to, um, you know, a good restaurant or lately a good restaurant is cookout. You know, you guys have been to cookout recently. Um, I don't know about the food, but you know what? There's a lot of it, and it's a good price. And so me and the guys and gals will go there. But you know what? It's like I get excited when I go. I get excited when I go on missions trips because I know that I'm going to be able to sample and take in a lot of the food of the different countries that I go to, be it Japan or Trinidad or Israel or, or in, in a couple weeks down into Nepal. So it's like um, I'm looking forward to all of those neat things that I'm going to be ingesting as I pray. Lord, it's still wiggling. Let it be safe. You know, one of those kinds of things, you know. It's like, Lord, okay, this is what's before me. All right, thank you, God. Well, do you approach the word of God that way, with that kind of appetite, that desire, as if it was a good steak? Well, it's about having your lives. Because remember, the word is truth and the truth is word. I want to show you what the Bible says about what or rather who the word of truth is. 
because ultimately it's about having our eyes or our lives consumed, consumed by Jesus. That's ultimately the thing here. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, in which was from the beginning we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Who is the word of life, church? Jesus. Jesus is the word of life. 1 John 5.7, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So who is the word, church? Jesus. You don't feel to be shy about saying that. Revelation 19, 13, I love this. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. Who is the word of God, church? Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. So Jesus is saying, you know, sanctify them, set them apart by your word of truth. And Jesus is the word of truth because he's considered the word in the Bible. And he is truth. So if you stick close to Jesus, if you're consumed by the things of Christ, then you will truly be sanctified or set apart. Verses 18 and 19, um, well, just to, to caveat that, if you're consumed by Jesus, then you're living according, and you're living according to the word of truth in your lives. Think about this, the impact. Think about being consumed with Jesus for your marriages. Think about being consumed with Jesus for your family. Consumed with Jesus on other relationships or, or things like that. Think about it. If you're consumed and about Jesus, think about what a blessing all of those other things in your life will be. Verses 18 and 19, it says this. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Again, set apart. Set apart by the truth. This is what I would consider commissioned and covered, this portion of Scripture, these two verses. Because Jesus says two things. One is, he says, as you sent me, Father, as you sent me out, my disciples I have sent out. And for them I have set myself apart for you to serve you and to set them also to do the same. Why did Jesus come to this place? To provide a way. To be that offering. To do the will of the Father. In, order, in other words, he was commissioned to do a specific task. To glorify the Father. To provide a way of salvation. And to show them who God the Father is. That was, his, that was his task. That was what he was commissioned for. And Jesus now is saying, listen, Father, as you sent me, I'm now going to be sending my disciples out into the world. I'm going to be sending them out as you sent me out. Remember, Jesus is like that ultimate missionary, commissioned from heaven, sent out by the Father to come to a place that was foreign, that was different, that he never had been before, and to live amongst you and I. Jesus was commissioned by the Father to do his will, to bring salvation to a dying and corrupted world, one that had no hope. And now he's commissioned them, and he's commissioned you sitting here this morning to do the same. I have three questions for you. Why are you saved? Why do you come to church? Why do you read your Bible? Three simple questions that I'm not expecting an answer for. It's rhetorical, but I want you to think about that. Why are you saved? Why do you come to church? Why do you read your Bible? I'll tell you my viewpoint. It's not the only one. It's just what I believe. The news is I've got for you, those three questions is, it's not for you. You weren't saved just so that you could go to heaven. You don't come to church just so that you could be fed the word of God and be filled and walk out here all like, man, I feel good. You weren't saved uh, uh, in a sense just to sit in your own little place to read your Bible by yourself. Look at this is challenging. There is a cost of discipleship. And the cost of discipleship is we 
First, our disciples under the disciplines of Christ, the teachings of Christ. And as his followers, we're called to not just sit, but to go. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus is instructing his disciples just to sit. The only other place I can see is where he says, go wait in Jerusalem until I send the Spirit. That's the only time that I can see that he's like, you know, you go hang out there. All through the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's like, go, go, go. Sit, therefore, and make disciples. How does that work? It doesn't, does it? Sit and make disciples. Okay. I'm waiting, Lord. It doesn't happen. You'll have a very lonely ministry doing that. You got to go out. So the news that I've got, it's not for you because you are a commissioned soldier in the Lord's army. Look at it this way. You're a missionary commissioned by God to do the same thing that he did in a world that he inherited. The same thing that he inherited, you have as well. And Jesus, in praying to the Father, knows the only way to be effective in this world is to be set apart and obedient to the truth of his word. That's to Jesus Christ. In verses 20 and 21, this is an area that I consider, Jesus thinks big picture. He really does. He thinks big picture with everything. Verses 20 and 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe. Future tense. In me through their word. Through their word. That they may all, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. So here Jesus is thinking big picture. Jesus always has big picture plans for your life as he does for his disciples. He doesn't expect them to stick around and hang out in, in Judea their whole lives, but to go into the outermost regions, into Judea, into Samaria, into their Jerusalem, into the outermost parts of the world. You see, Jesus doesn't expect us just to sit, but to go. And his big picture plans truly, look in the mirror, begin with each of you. They really do. Not with the pastor of the church, not with the leadership of the church, not by just following on the coattails of what we do in the sense of this and that, but also what is your thing? What has God called you to do? Whether it's within your church or, or without, on the outside of your church. A ministry to the homeless, perhaps. Um, um, a, a pantry, uh, um, going out and having a prayer ministry. Set up a prayer tent, man, on the corner of, of Richmond Road and Bypass or out by CW. Go set up. Hey, you need prayer? I'm going to do that one of these days. It's like set up an easy up and go, need prayer? And just sit there and go, okay. I guess I did say sit, didn't I? <laughs> Scratch that example. <laughs> I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, you know what I mean. Know this, guys. Jesus loves you so much, but he doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But instead, he's chosen you to be a part of this plan. And in this, he's, he, he's, he, he wants you to be a part of his plan. He desires you to be a part of his plan. So Jesus prays not only for the present time that he is in, but for those future children who have been chosen before the foundations of time. Those kids. What a rich history you guys have and I have. We have a very rich history, a very rich legacy, as, it would, as I would think of it. You and I are all direct descendants from the original apostles, including the apostle Paul and others. You're direct descendants of them. Because if they huddled in a corner and stayed in the upper room and they didn't do what God had commissioned them to do, you and I probably would not have salvation today because it would have started and ended with those guys there. Think about that. But you and I are direct descendants of those guys in the spiritual sense. I think it's kind of cool. Jesus 
could go to the cross at this time knowing his work was not in vain. He's praying for his guys. He's asking God to sanctify them and set them apart, to empower them by his Holy Spirit, to do incredible things, to definitely go. And he has full confidence in knowing that the work that he has begun and finished is not in vain and that his work has been completed. He then prays in verse 21 for a oneness among his children. Oh, that's so needed within the body of Christ. A oneness among his children, just as with his original apostles. Jesus, know this, guys, doesn't pray for what I would call uniformity, and he does not pray in this prayer for institutional unity. He's not praying for those aspects for, the, for his children, but he's praying more so for a personal dynamic of unity, I believe, that brings his church together within a lot of diversity. You know, coming from the West Coast was one thing and seeing diversity. And unfortunately, I don't see a lot of diversity even within the body of Christ here in the, in, in the region that, that we minister in and we live in today. And it breaks my heart because there is unity within diversity because that's the way Jesus intended it. And so it's very important that we reach out to our brothers and sisters, no matter where they've come from, no matter what they look like, no matter what their socioeconomic standing is, no matter what, we need to reach out to them because that's what Jesus did, did he not? How can we say we want to be like Christ and not emulate those characteristics and qualities of our Lord? There are plenty of requirements, rest assured, for uniformity within churches today, and that only seeks to unite the wheats and the tares together, I believe. And it doesn't provide a unity of the spirit, but it creates unity in religion, creates unity in tradition, and it creates unity in denomination. Those are three things that, as far as I read the Bible, Christ came to bring us clarity in those areas and abolish those things. Tradition, denomination, and religion. Jesus is not about religion. Jesus is not about tradition. Jesus is not about denomination. He's not. And so I think we need to really look at that when Jesus is praying for such a thing as this. The unity Jesus prays for, though, comes at high stakes, gang, and at a high cost. There's risk involved for the Lord and for Jesus. Why? Because you and I are in the mix. <laughs> You and I are in the mix. And he, and he is using you, choosing to use you and I to get the message of salvation out. There's a risk. It's high stakes, and it came at a great cost. He relies on how you and I will represent him to the world. This verse speaks to us, I believe, and shows us that unity in diversity can work. Look at the apostles. Look at where they came from, the different lives they came from before becoming his disciples. And if the body of Christ, meaning the church, can reflect better the life, the love, and the teaching of Jesus, I believe then that we will be able to provoke the world to jealousy. And then they would be able to say, tell me about the God that you follow. Tell me about him, because I've been watching your life, and I'm a little bit jealous. I'm a little bit envious. Verse 22, this is what I would consider or call this, this verse, we bring unification through glorification. Verse 22, in the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Speaking of he and the Father again. And he seeks and he desires that to be a relationship we have. We have been given the glory of God through his salvation, no doubt about that. And it's through our salvation that unites us as being one in the spirit. Do you understand? Our salvation unites us. I can go across the world to a brother or sister in Christ and I don't know them from Adam. I don't know where that came from, but it's like, I don't know them from Adam, right? I don't know where that term came from. Anybody have Siri with them? <laughs> oh, it's a test because your phone should be off. No, it's, but seriously. You know, um, I lost my place. Where was I? 
Yes, yes, yes. Wait, I, wherever I go, thank you, wherever I go, you know, because I'm saved and because the folks in Japan or the folks in Trinidad or Israel or wherever I go and we go as a church, um, they're saved. Man, there's, there's unity. There's commonality. There's oneness. Because they know the God that I know. They follow the Jesus that I follow. And there's great, great joy in that. And so, you know, that's why it's important. That's the one in spirit. A few things on that. We are many, though, but we are one. Romans 12, 5 says, So being many, understanding we are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're many, but we are one. We all have the same Savior. I want you to know that. We all have the same Savior, those who are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. We all have the same Savior. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. For we, through many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of the one bread, and that is the bread of life. That is Jesus Christ. Third thing is we are different, but now the same. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. We're all the same. We weren't the same coming other than the fact that we knew we needed a Savior, but now we're the same because we've all been baptized in the name of Jesus. We've all given our lives to Jesus. And uh, whether what background we come from, whether what we look like, whether what status we have according to the world, we are all brothers and sisters in Jesus. Every one of us are. Fourth thing is we've all been saved by the same cross. The same cross provided that way. Every one of you and I, it is the same cross. The meaning is the same for each and every one of us. Ephesians 2.16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. It's all the same cross, guys. Verses 23 and 24, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory of which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Sound familiar? Oh, um, and we'll stop right there at, at 24. Unity is only found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is speaking in the context of unity amongst the body of Christ. And unity in this, in this particular two verses is only found, I believe, in Jesus Christ. We can look different, think different, be different in many ways, but we can all and should be agreeing on what the Word of God says, on what this says. This is our plumb line, as it tells us in Amos. This is what we follow, and we adhere to the Word of God. Unity is not found in a church, I'll tell you that. Unity is not found in a denomination. Unity is not found in tradition. Unity is only found in Jesus Christ. That's it. I say this because we can agree or we can disagree on how church should be. We can agree and disagree on how church should look like. But in the end, if none of us is submitted, given over to Jesus Christ, then we won't agree on anything, guys. We've got to agree on the Word of God. Believe it and agree upon it. We may agree or disagree with each other, but we must agree with Jesus in everything. One of the guys on our leadership says, you know, I don't want to hear about your opinion or what you think, but bring it from the Word of God, and I'll listen. And if I need to change when you bring me things from the Word of God, I will change. But it's not about our opinions. It's not about our beliefs. Not about our own thoughts. It's about the Word of God. The truth of His Word is the important thing. In closing, 25 and 26, Jesus now says, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you have shown me may be in them and I in them. This is what I call the final chapter or mission accomplished, you know? 
Mission accomplished. Jesus has done it. Jesus has run the race well. Jesus has followed the will and executed the will of the Father and that of which he's been commissioned to do from heaven. I want you to notice the progression of the acknowledgement of the Father. In verse 1, Jesus comes to him as his son, saying, Father, Father, the hour has come. He's in a time that he needs comfort from his dad. He's in a time that he needs for his dad to hear his heart. And so he opens it up in a very intimate and special way, I believe, by saying, Father, Daddy, Abba. Secondly, in verse 11, he addresses him as Holy Father. It's great that we see this Father because he is the only Father that can truly sanctify. And thirdly, Righteous Father in verse 25. The first acknowledgement in verse 1 shows his relationship, I believe. The second acknowledgement in verse 2, holy, or in verse 11, Holy Father, shows only the Father can do the sanctifying work in his disciples, in his children. And the third acknowledgement, Righteous Father, shows that a righteous Father, only a righteous Father can glorify his children. Only a righteous Father can. The world doesn't know anything about righteousness. The world knows nothing about what it means to be a righteous father. The world doesn't. Because the father of this world is not righteous at all, is he? In fact, Ephesians 2.2 says, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, meaning the plan, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's the world. It knows not righteousness. It has its own set of rules of what, they, what it believes is righteous and honor, honorable. Jesus says, I have known you to the Father. I think this is important. Jesus is about to head to the cross as we talked about already. Yet he's full of faith and triumph. I have known you, Dad. I have known you. Finally, Jesus speaks on the love of the Father. I think this is so important and so just typical Jesus on how he follows through and follows up on things. It's so Jesus, is it not? He speaks of the love of the Father and he finishes with the greatest, I believe, the greatest blessing of Christian living. The greatest blessing that we have is the love of Jesus dwelling in each and every one of you. That is the greatest blessing. And Jesus ends with that. And he says, I've declared them to you, Dad. I've given them your name. And will declare it also that the love in which you loved me may be in them and I in them. In our foyer, take a look at it on your way out right now when we disperse. In John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. That's the anchor verse for this church. Those are the words of our Lord. And that this church, along with our greatest blessing in Jesus, is anchored by the love and in the love of the Father. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you so much that we are here this morning. And that truly, Lord, I pray that each and every one here, that they too declare your name and declare your love to the world. That they be salt and light that they, Lord, show, they manifest the things of you in their lives outwardly, that they not play Christianity, but they be Christianity, that they not play church, but they be the church, and that, Lord, that you bring a, a further setting apart in their lives. As we have been set apart by you, God, may we further be set apart, sanctified by your love, your grace, and your mercy, and may we pass that on to others as well. Let us provoke others to the goodness of Christ by the testimony of our everyday life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys. If